Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ninth annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture. A very warm welcome to our guests that are on stage. Um, we have Mr. Strive Masiwa, founder and chairman of the Econet Group. We have Niklas Kjellstrom Matzege, chair of board of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation and also Piyusha Kotecha, CEO of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. Of course, we have to welcome our very honored guest this evening, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu and Mrs. Leah Tutu. Yes. I'd also like to welcome Archbishop Tabo Mahoba. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We would also like to acknowledge the esteemed guests in our audience. So welcome to all the honorable ministers, the honorable deputy ministers, the diplomatic corps and consulates, the Tutu family that is present here this evening, all media that has joined us and the members of the public who are also our esteemed guests. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Claire Mawisa and I am honored to be your program director for tonight. This annual Peace Lecture is an African platform for dialogue on social and humanitarian issues that affect us locally, on the continent, and globally. The intention is to continue the conversations that have been led by Desmond Tutu to forge peace and reconciliation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to please stand for the national anthem that will be brought to us by the Cape Town Philharmonic Wind Ensemble. Thank you so much, you may be seated. We are very thankful to the city of Cape Town who have partnered with the foundation to host this event this evening. And I'd like to please welcome on stage a representative from the city of Cape Town, Councillor Dr. Zahid Badruddin.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Molweni, Huyamora, Assalamu Alaikum. This evening, we have the great privilege of celebrating one of our greatest icons of our democracy, a free man of the city of Cape Town, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, our arch. What an occasion it is for us to gather here today, not simply to come together for today's auspicious lecture, but also to have the opportunity to be able to celebrate his birthday as well. A hero is a person that gives courage. A hero gives hope, even when there seems to be little hope to give. Our arch is and has been throughout his life a true hero, not only in our country, but the world. And as a city and as a country, we face many challenges. We continue to be pained by the recent protests against gender based and violence, but also social hardships and broken communities that we as a city are making every effort to address. As a country, when we have no hope, we look to the arch for direction. When we are afraid, we look to the arch for courage. And when we feel that the world is too cruel to keep on fighting, we look to the arch for bravery and hope. We, the generation that the arch and his generation fought for, will not let them down. We promise to play our part in bringing peace to the world, to shine light in the darkness, and to follow the example that they have set for us. Whenever it becomes difficult, we will try a little harder because we stand on the shoulders of the arch, a giant indeed. And even though as a city we grapple with these challenges, we are animated by the potential of collaboration and of partnership, by the potential of using our differences as a unifier to bring us together as a people for each other. And in so doing, we appreciate all role players and stakeholders who have taken our hands and walked this journey towards the realization of a more cohesive South Africa, towards the realization and attainment of the Rainbow Nation. And it is our partnership with the Legacy Foundation, which is of premium importance to the city of Cape Town, and we will continue to engage to see their projects to fruition. On behalf of the city of Cape Town, I would like to welcome each and every one of you here this evening. May we appreciate every minute. May we appreciate every pearl of wisdom that is shared with us tonight. And as we continue on the road that the arch has laid out, I call on all residents to join the city of Cape Town in promoting peace, reconciliation and respect in all that we do. We have taken great strides. We have taken great strides, but there's more work to be done. And it is only by joining hands that we will be able to realize the city's vision and make progress possible together. In the Archer's words, your ordinary acts of love and hope point to the extraordinary promise that every human life is inestimable in value. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the mother city of Cape Town. Thank you so much, Councillor. And just as the councillor alluded to, today is a very special day for somebody who is celebrating their birthday. But enough about me and my birthday. I'd like us to take this opportunity to do the right thing and sing happy birthday to our beloved Arch who's here this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you clear your throats so we can do an incredible rendition of a happy birthday accompanied by um, the Cape Philharmonic Wind Ensemble. Are we ready? Let's do it.
and the, even the candles got blown out. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, to the Cape Philharmonic Wind Ensemble, and of course, to the granddaughters of Desmond Tutu, Joy and Niani. So thank you so much for that slice of Cape. Keep a slice for me. Now, with the build-up to the lecture, we recorded a brief message and blessing from a multi-faith group. So I'd like us just to take a moment and turn our attentions to the screens. Shalom. Right now, Jewish people around the world are celebrating the Jewish New Year. And it is incumbent upon us to repent and correct all past errors and start afresh. We are probing the recesses of our hearts, recalling the errors of the past, and commit ourselves to be better in the future. Isn't it wonderful that I have this opportunity right now, during these days of awe, to bless this gathering of the International Peace Lecture in honor of our eminent Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who in many ways is the symbol of our nation. May I bless you all who toiled bringing this gathering together and as a reflection bless our nation with the following. May all of us, the people of South Africa, reflect on our past and repent for our wrongdoing whether we did wrong intentionally or whether we did it by omission when we failed to stand up and fight for the right thing. May we all commit ourselves now to do the right things, now and in the future. And if we see others acting corruptly, let us be brave and call it foul. It is not an easy task, but if our nation managed to turn evil into good, in 1994, we can do it again now. We should start by teaching all our children in our land that they are loved, that they are respected, and that they must live their lives well. They can do it by doing good and not evil. May we follow in the footsteps of our loved Archbishop, our beloved icon, and commit to uproot all negativity and evil and be good, and do good. Amen. On behalf of the Cape Town Interfaith Initiative, we come to bless this event and to thank you for the opportunity. Great Spirit, heavenly creative source of the universe whose nature is love, you have heard the cry of our hearts for authentic and wise spiritual leadership. And we thank you for the opportunity presented by this annual lecture, the Desmond Tutu Lecture, for the voice of wisdom to come through and illuminate the path for ourselves and our nation. We thank you for the words of wisdom and we thank you for opening the hearts and minds and ears of all those who need to hear these words of wisdom. We thank you for the opportunity to amplify the voice of compassion and love. And we know that those who use this platform, who have been called to this platform, work in full alignment for the greater good. May we hear, may we be strengthened, May our hearts be filled with gratitude and may we be inspired to take the action necessary to create a cohesive community, to create the kind of community that has been envisioned by the great leaders, the Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, Madiba. May we hear the wisdom that is true in all eternity, through the ages, may we in turn be true to the voice of love, compassion, and wisdom. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I begin with the name of God, the most compassionate, the dispenser of grace. I greet you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of God be upon you all. Please join me in a special prayer. 
Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, O Lord of compassion and mercy, we are grateful for this gathering and we thank you for each mind and heart that fills the presence of this venue. We ask you to bless this occasion and allow the love here this evening to flourish across the length and breadth of our beloved country. Ya Karim, O generous and bountiful one, we find ourselves in distressing times and we come to you with prayers for all in our land, but more especially for those who are voiceless and relegated to the fringes of society. Open our eyes and our hearts and help to remind us that every human life is valuable and that none of us can be truly free while others are oppressed. We ask you, in the words of our beloved Arch, wake us up and shake us up and bring us together as one family. Allahumma anta salam O God, thou art peace. Wa minka salam and peace emanates from thee. Fahayina rabbana bisalam Allow us to live and to subsist in peace. We ask this in all of your beautiful and holy names, Lord of all humankind and of all cultures. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much to all of our representatives. As former CEO of the South African University's Vice Chancellor's Associations and then CEO of the Southern African Regional University Association, the next speaker has played a leading role in the reorganization of post-apartheid South Africa higher education sector and in forging a common purpose among the Southern African universities. She has her sights set on establishing the foundation as a globally networked center of knowledge and discourse. I would like to please welcome to the podium Piyushi Kotecha, the CEO of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. Claire, uh, clearly omitted to look at the script that you were provided with tonight. Um, good evening, honored guests. Um, it's such a pleasure to, to see you here tonight. Um, my task tonight is short and to the point. Um, welcome again by way of introduction to this ninth uh, International Peace Lecture. You know what you have to look forward to next year, uh, which will be the 10th anniversary of this particular Peace Lecture. This is an event, or rather a program, initiated eight years ago on the Archbishop's 80th birthday. This important lecture is one core platform of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation's work. It is an annual opportunity for diverse thought leaders to respond to the deepest human and planetary conundrums of our time against the backdrop of the values and wisdom of our founders. The Foundation is presently exploring new strategies on leveraging this annual knowledge harvest beyond the event itself through embedding the learning in other programmatic work and in society. Uh, whatever expression we find in our legacy work would be incomplete if the historical is not linked to the present and for future generations and posterity. We will be talking to other similar foundations and similarly minded institutions nationally and globally in this regard. The Legacy Foundation is an active center of knowledge. It would serve little purpose for the knowledge to be gathering dust. 
Ladies and gentlemen, those of all of you who have joined us tonight, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm new to the Tutu firmament, that I stand before you as the CEO of the Legacy Foundation on a platform very much built by others, and that the Legacy Foundation is itself a relatively young institution. I therefore like to acknowledge all who, over the years, have contributed to securing and perpetuating Archbishop Tutu's rich legacy in all its forms. From members of the Tutu family and staff to those who have sustained the dream of a Desmond Tutu Peace Center in Cape Town and from universities at home and abroad to a global circle of organizations and outstanding individuals. The Arch has been very generous and um, his, his work and his lessons and the archives are literally all over the world. So we face a massive task in collecting this and, and giving it uh, contemporary expression. These people who I've just responded to um, and acknowledged, the Archbishop Tutu has often said that these are the shoulders on whom he stood, on whose shoulders the foundation stands today. It is a network that deserves deep nurturing and growth, and we will do our best to um, justify uh, the objectives that we've set out. As a new CEO, I would like to put my experience towards the development of impactful strategic direction, effective programs, and governance with regard to our own organization and new programs, and building key partnerships with like-minded organizations and individuals. We have a massive job to do, and we will need all the partnerships that we can secure, both locally, nationally, on the African continent, and internationally, given that the Arch is one of the 21 international icons, as one of the few uncompromised individuals um, um, uh, on earth. Archbishop and Mrs. Tutu, from our premises in the fantastic old granary, granary complex, which has so generously been provided by the city of Cape Town, the foundation is plotting a sustainable course. We're growing into the place, hard at work in taking stock off and developing the Tutu archives which are in our possession and busy planning our journey to create and give expression to the values and principles so ably gifted to us as a nation by Archbishop Tutu in the pre- and post-apartheid era. There are many opportunities for this creative expression from the physical memorabilia, including the establishment of a world-class museum, and we've already begun to create powerful connections with partners in this field. It is a formidable task, and no small feat, but we're going to get busy uh, on, this, on this important um, um, project that we have. Already today, our speaker, just as a result of conversations back in the groom, green room, has promised us many partnerships, which we will keep him to um, within the year. Uh, so hopefully we'll have good news to share with you um, next year. Dialogue 2 is crucial to our vision, keeping alive the conversations you've had about decency, dignity, justice, bravery, compassion, respect and love for each other and the earth. Following your lead, we will not be shy to support that which is fair and that which is good. Managing the corrosive impacts of human greed, the topic of tonight's lecture is, of course, one such conversation. As the Arch has said several years ago, and I quote, most alarmingly we have evolved over the 18 years of our democracy from an organized nation of activists for social change, for common good, to a nation apparently preoccupied with the accumulation of personal wealth. Of course, it's not just South Africa's problem, it's a global disease. And that is why we have Strai Mashiba this evening and thank you very much. We're most grateful for you to accept, for accepting this brief and agreeing to share your knowledge with us this evening. We welcome you to our event with great anticipation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Piyushi. Our next speaker has served on boards of organizations such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Elders Advisory Board, where he supported leaders such as President Jimmy Carter, Grasha Michelle, Richard Branson, and Desmond Tutu in their work for peace. Now I'd like to introduce to you the chair of the Desmond 
um, and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation Chair of the Board, Mr. Niklas Kjellstrom Matseke. Thank you, dear, honored guests. In the tapestry of lives, there are certain threads that only become visible over time. But once you've spotted them, they are so glaringly obvious that you wonder how you ever could have missed them. I mean, I don't necessarily possess the blonde looks typical for the region, but it's true that I was born in the colorful and colorblind kingdom of Sweden. And that's due to my late father, who was forced into exile, fleeing in South Africa in the wake of the Sharpel massacre. He came from a very political family, and his father had been a founding member of the ANC and president in the Transvaal African Congress. But I felt Swedish. So after completing university, I went into business. But maybe because of the combination of the moral righteousness in the society of Sweden at the time and my activist DNA from South Africa, it made me drawn into the direction of sustainable business and social development. And to me, it's about ethics, also in business. If you think of it, ethical business, I can't do corruption, ethical businesses, that can't spew carbon into the atmosphere, and they can't disregard vulnerable people. No, because they get it. They understand that the Earth resources are finite and that there is only so many fish in the sea. So my work exposed me to a large number of great people, people like Desmond and Leah Tutu. And you have had a profound impact on my life and my family's life. You brought us on a journey for over 10 years where we have been discovering ourselves, introducing me to my own South African family and my ancestors, but also in a global perspective, the responsibility to each other and to the planet, to Ubuntu. And through Auntie Leah, we learned about our great uncle, a family principal in Soweto at the time, who not only taught her, but also would lend books to a very young version of the arch. Although we were comfortable in Sweden, it was like Arch and Auntie Leah had put something in our drinks. We felt the urge for South Africa, and now we are home. So our goal at the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation, it's not a sentimental one, and it's not to build a shrine. Many people around the world have said, and I quote, Desmond Tutu is representing a particular set of values uniquely revealed through God, gentle love, and a courageous activism. So these values are perhaps his greatest legacy. And over the years, we have been expressed, they have been expressed through multiple prisms. You know, if you think from apartheid struggle, the TRC, to the post-apartheid South Africa, from gender injustice to climate injustice at present, and from the genocide in Rwanda to the current slow genocide of the Rohingyas. 
So the archbishop is, he's biased. He takes sides. He abhors conflicts, but he doesn't shrink from it. He doesn't back down. If you're neutral in a situation of injustice, then you are taking the side of the oppressor, he says. Think about that. So if an elephant steps on a foot, steps his foot on a tail of a mouse, and you say that you are neutral, maybe the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. So now the arch has retired, as we know from public life, and unfortunately, his, the challenges that he's been fighting, they have not retired. They live strongly in homophobia, Islamophobia, xenophobia, racism, gender-based violence. They live in Palestine, in Kashmir, and in the rising tide of climate apartheid. And we will see the poor, and again, paying for the excesses of the rich countries. So, they keep living in corruption, in a global disease, which corrodes any possibility we may have to achieve our development goals and to create a sustainable world for all people. If we are to do Arch and Auntie Leah justice and their legacy, then we have to defend humanity and this planet. And many of you actually know Arch and Auntie Leah better than I do. So we need your help. We need your help to infuse the Tutu character into the foundation. Strive Masiova, our esteemed speaker tonight, he embodies many of these characteristics. And from a bag of sweets that he was given by his mother at the age of eight, who wanted him to make his own pocket money, he was sent off to school and get to work. But he also had to conquer how to read, how to count, and how to sell. These were fundamentals for him to build an empire worth billions today. But maybe even more impressive is that he exudes vision and courage. You think about it, instead of being consumed at the, by the challenges in Zimbabwe at the time, he saw opportunities which brought him into the mobile revolution. That's courage. That's vision. When he saw the child soldiers in the communities in Liberia, and he can see similar patterns in Zimbabwe, but this time from H and HIV, what did he do? He, together with his wife, gathered 50 children and helped them to help themselves by pushing them through school. One day the wife came home and said, they're not 50 anymore, they're 5,000. And today, more than a quarter of a million. That's vision and courage. So what Strive's story shows us is that compassion and money are not mutually exclusive. That business and human rights are not incompatible. And maybe it is just this simple, that it's up to every leader to use his or her power platform and decide themselves how they want to lead and use that power wisely. I thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. And it's now time for our keynote speaker. 
Mr. Strive Masiwa, our lecturer tonight, is both a leading businessman and indeed a leading human being. He was one of the first to recognize the opportunity of the digital revolution here in Africa from his native Zimbabwe and built a giant global telecommunications, media and technology group known as Econet Wireless. Niklas also said incredible words about him, so I do not want to waste any more time. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to our lecture tonight, Mr. Strive Masiwa. Good evening, everyone. What a wonderful pleasure and privilege it is to be here tonight in Cape Town. You know, when I came to South Africa in 2000, um, I lived here for 10 years. You know, I made one big mistake. I didn't live in Cape Town. Now, how dumb is that? <clears throat> yeah. Good evening, everyone. What a profound honor and blessing it is this evening to be with you, Arch, and Mamalia here in Cape Town. It's deeply humbling and to be celebrating your birthday. Great icon, thank you. Thank you. You know, I have had privilege to travel with the Arch. And I've been promising myself that one day I'm gonna go and sit down with him and write a book called The Collection of the Arch's Favorite Jokes. <laughs> Your amazingly profound jokes have lifted me up on many, many a difficult day. You know, talking of which, Arch, uh, had me as an ambassador uh, on one of his programs. And we traveled together. So there was a group of us, about seven of us, and we used to go around the world with Arch. But there's one I particularly remember, we went to Portugal. I don't know if you remember Arch. So we arrived and they were waiting for us at the airport. There were maybe 50, 100 people waving as we came through. And when the barrier was lifted, people moved forward and they surrounded Arch. And I was standing next to the other member of the ambassador group. And I said to him, now that's a real rock star. And he said, I agree. And the guy was Peter Gabriel. <laughs> Arch, thank you. Emeritus Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Mamalia Tutu, Archbishop Tabo Makoba, members of the Tutu family, Piyushi Kotecha, the CEO, and Nicholas Gelstrom Matseka, the leadership of the Desmond Tutu Foundation, distinguished guests, um, members of the government, dear friends. It is a distinguished honor for me to be here, uh, to be speaking about corruption, because that's what you asked me to come and talk about. I wish I was talking about something else, but let's talk about corruption. You know, as I came here, I was reflecting what I should talk about. Why would you gather here to listen to a businessman like me talk about corruption? I wonder, maybe you think it's, maybe I'm coming in from the other side. Maybe a few secrets. The topic of corruption is hotly debated in Africa, and rightly so. We have debated corruption in Africa from the birth of the African state. 
1957. It has vexed us. Our people have called for change. Sometimes it's been violent. The militaries would come in and say, we are getting rid of the corrupt. And sometimes we did it through the ballot box. And yet the corrupt are still with us. What is corruption? In many ways it means different things to different people. I sometimes whether when we talk about corruption, whether we are all talking about the same thing. Formally corruption can be defined as the abuse of entrusted authority for implicit, for licit gain. That's truly what we're talking about. Because sometimes, I'm an engineer, and I always say you can't solve something you can't define. If corruption becomes everything, we can't solve it. But we're talking here as the abuse of entrusted trust for illicit gain. I'm not here to talk about what happens in corporations. I'm talking about that abuse which can take place between a corporation and those who are entrusted with the public trust, the public purse, the public authority. I'm a businessman. I've been in business in Africa for 33 years. Boy, I have a lot of secrets. <laughs> I can tell you a lot about corruption. Many of you know about my battles in Zimbabwe, well documented. I simply wanted a mobile license, young on tech entrepreneur. I thought, well, why can't I have, why can't I set a mobile license? They're setting up MTN in South Africa, why can't we have one here in Zimbabwe? It took me five years battling through the courts. I could have ended in a single day by just accommodating certain people. I chose not to. And every day people would come and say, Come on, you accommodate this one and this one and this one and we'll go to the president and we'll do this and it'll get done. I said no. It went all the way to our constitutional court until the monopoly was broken by the courts and ended up setting the only mobile network in the entire world licensed by a court of law. That company went on to become a major corporation in Zimbabwe. But I paid a price. I had to leave. So I left Zimbabwe on the 22nd of March 2000, just short of 20 years now. I have not been back. Uh, many of you know the highly documented story. I was in Nigeria running a successful mobile network, competing fiercely with MTN. When one day some of my shareholders came and they said, here, there's a certain way we do business. I said, how so? So, well, you know, we have to give the governor $4 million. By the way, it's not you actually giving the money because it's the company. You just happen to be the signatory. I said, you mean it needs my check, my fingers? They said, yes. I said, I'm not signing. They said, then you'll have to leave. So I left. I abandoned everything. I left. 
It triggered a court battle that went all the way to the United Kingdom. And by the time we were finished, the matter had reached epic proportions. The governor ended on trial in the United Kingdom for corruption and was sentenced to 13 years in prison. The only successful prosecution of any major leader in history that ended up with prosecution. So I've been there. I remember arriving one day in New York. As you know, you know, as you clear immigration, the immigration guy says, uh, you're Mr. Masio? I said, yes. They said, somebody from the government would like to see you. I said, from the government? Like who? He said, they call them here the FBI. Then he looked at me and said, don't worry. You're with the angels, but they do want to see you. Now that's Uncle Sam, in case you don't know. Taken to a side room. Mr. Masiwa, you, do you remember a meeting in London on such and such a day? There were three of you in the room. I said, I don't. He said, well, let's remind you. So he reads out an email. I said, yes, I wrote that email. He said, yes. Why did you say in the email, don't you ever, I was writing to the bank that had set up the meeting. I said, these men you, you introduced me to, they're corrupt. They're corrupt to the core. I don't want to deal with them again. So, well, you know, it's interesting to us. Why did you say that? And with it, I said, so, am I with the good guys? They said, you're with the good guys. We're looking for witnesses. Because we've just caught the guys you called corrupt. And we need some witnesses. Will you be a witness? I said, well, they were corrupt. What more do you want to know? <laughs> corrupt is corrupt. They were Americans. And what I'm trying to tell you is corrupt comes from everywhere. It's not just Africans. As many of you know, one of my uh, commitments is to mentor young people particularly those who are entrepreneurs. I seek to, to teach them not only the, the craft of the entrepreneur, you know, 33 years you learn a trick or two, but I try to share with them some of the things that I've experienced to encourage them that it is possible here in Africa to run a successful business, to do successful things in business without corruption. Arch, as one of my first book, I, I reached out to young people and I said to them, I'm going to be giving a lecture for the arch. You know, I have four million followers on Facebook. And they say my platform has reached uniquely 63 million people in the last six years. And uh, my platform comes up all the time as the most engaged followership in the world. So we really get into issues. And a couple of years ago, I, I said to them, I'm gonna write a series to you on corruption. And I ended up with a 16 part story about corruption. 
Because you've got to show them what you've gone through yourself. I told them a story about, I was sitting in my office when we're trying to buy a piece of real estate, just land buildings in Lagos, Nigeria. Now, I don't think all the corruptions in Nigeria, this one had nothing to do with Nigerians. So we're buying this building to put our equipment in, and it turns out that this building belongs to the Liberian Embassy. And they're selling the building because they needed to move from Lagos to Abuja. It's quite a few years back. So I'm going through the papers. I'm about to sign, and I notice that the transfers to Switzerland. I said, don't they have an account in Monrovia somewhere we can send the money? They said, no, no. So I made the joke. I said, notice, it doesn't even have somebody's name on it. So it's true that the Swiss put all bank accounts in numbers. I thought that was in the movies. <laughs> so it wasn't funny. The ambassador came and said, uh, if you don't sign, you're going to lose the building. I said, if you don't give me a Monrovia account, I'm not going to sign. So they came back and they said, well, look, actually the president is going to call you. I said, no need, just Monrovia bank account. They said, there's a misunderstanding. His brother will come in to see you. I said, tell the president, no need to send me the brother, just send me Monrovia bank account, okay? And I started enjoying myself. I said, also cabinet paper, all cabinet members. This is $3 million, guys, come on, come on. So it went on for a week. At the end of the week, I said, thanks, but no thanks. The president was Charles Taylor. A couple of months later, he was taken down. I've seen a few things along the way, shall we say. Corruption is no laughing matter. It can never be. Nations are destroyed by corruption. And yet we talk about it. We talk about it almost in a cynical way, I guess. It's uh, come elections, up comes the topic of corruption. And then it dies away. People are cynical. You ask me about the public trust. But our people don't believe we can do anything because of the impunity. Corruption has no color, no religion, no gender. I've met corrupt men, I've met corrupt women, and I've met corrupt white folk. Corruption is corruption, and make no mistake, both giver and receiver are corrupt. I was in that room, I know you know the famous story where we, had, we gathered, David Cameron, the Prime Minister of Britain, gathered anti-corruption activists, and I found myself amongst the activists, and we were in London. And then he let slip on the mic, he said, the Nigerians are fabulously corrupt, man, to the queen. And we thought, we're going to walk out of here, you know. President Buhari says, cool it, cool it. I'm going to tell him one thing or two. And he says, you know, it's, all I want is the assets back. Because the assets are over there in the Swiss bank accounts. Have you, did any of you followed Nigeria's attempts to get their Bacha money back? 
Now, everybody knows he stuffed $4 billion into bank accounts. And for the last generation, lawyers, some of the best lawyers in the world, protect that loot on behalf of the, of the Abacha family. And now they come forward and say, okay, we'll cut a deal, we'll give you half. And of the half, the Swiss government and the Jersey and all these guys, we'll take half. Amazing. Anyway, I'm not here to, to speak for the Swiss. And I'm also not here to share narratives. We can, we could spend the whole night. We have an interesting challenge. 53% of the world's technically defined young people are Africans. Our mean age is 19 as a continent. We're the world's youngest continent. At the turn of the century, 40% of the world's population will be Africans. We're sending onto the street one million young Africans turn 18 every month. 12 million hitting the job market. We have a massive, massive crisis of job creation, youth unemployment. I think there is general consensus that for us to create those jobs, Africa needs an entrepreneurial a revolution on an unprecedented scale. Put another way, we need more than ever for Africans to start businesses. It's about starting businesses. Guys, we have to start and build businesses. We almost have to start building businesses when we're in high school now. Because if we don't, everything we fought for, everything we've hoped for, is on the line. But how do we do it if, every, if a survey after survey is telling us that young people think business people in Africa are corrupt, black and white, state capture, call it what you may, it's called corruption. It's almost a dichotomy. That's not what they think in China about entrepreneurs. That's not what they think in Europe or the United States. But it's Africa. Is it a perception? Is it real? How do we turn to these very young people and say, you can go out there, you can start businesses, it's not about tenders, it's not about who you know, you can create and build Africa's next generation of great companies and businesses that can generate wealth. So we have to deal with this core perception and the reality of corruption. Perhaps if I may, I'd like to make some suggestions. As I say, I, I have these interactions with our young people. Can I share with you some of the things I've said to them when we've talked about corruption? about the things we need to do. Change our mindsets. Corruption is not inevitable. It's not unstoppable. That's what the corrupt would like you to believe. And we are certainly 
no different it is going to take a generational fight just like we had to take on apartheid colonialism and other things this is the pandemic of our time this is the elephant in the room to africa's progress we need genuine reform of policies and a legislation framework to improve transparency and accountability. This we know. We have to remove opportunities of arbitrage, the ability to elicit gain through the use of authority. We need to put teeth into enforcement and to end the culture of impunity. It's not that we don't have legislative frameworks to fight corruption. Actually, I know the laws here. We read them in boardrooms, would you believe, and we discuss them. But if you say Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, American, men stand up and go to the bathroom. You know why? There's enforcement. If you say the UK Anti-Bribery Act, people start coughing. Because if you trip over it, there's enforcement. You, they will come after you. Like they came after those gentlemen that I talked about. They were in Africa, some of them. Others were in Israel. But they could tell you they had teeth of enforcement. So it's not about policy making. We need smart policy making or smart legislature. And certainly we must have legislature that aligns with the rhetoric we speak on corruption. We say a lot on corruption, but we don't find enough legislation to support the level of rhetoric. And those who are involved in corruption know it, but you need enforcement. That capacity to reach out and unfortunately for us in Africa, you can't go after an Abacha or a James Ibori, the governor in, the United, in Nigeria. Because it, the people who can do that on that scale, they can also hire some smart lawyers and smart bankers. So the, the architecture that we have around institutions like Interpol isn't enough. We need to take the American Foreign Corrupt Practices Act as the gold standard. And now say to India and China and Israel and Brazil and Europe, where are you on this? Because without them, we're never gonna win this. You can catch the petty guy who shakes you down at the, at the traffic lights or the guy who shakes you down over your passport. But to go after the big guys, we need a global architecture for it. But what's happening now is people are saying, well, you know, maybe the US went too far. Barack Obama and them were pushing it a little bit. I don't believe that to be so. We, we have to fight even with the little that we have. It's, it's not enough to put your hands up and say, we can't win, because that's where they want you to be. As I move towards closing my, my lecture, I want to just give you a little bit of my shopping list. This global anti-corruption agency is one of my first requests. So I've said we need to ensure that we are dealing in our policy making and in our legislative framework 
including the institutions of enforcement. That needs smart work. We've not been good at it. We need to make sure that we are policing the ability of people in authority to exercise discretion. Where there is discretion left to a few shadowy individuals, if corruption isn't taking place, better it will. It's just human nature, I'm afraid. You know, there will be a price to pay. And we've got to tell the generation of young people that there is nothing worth fighting for for which you're not prepared to pay the price. We shout corruption, but we still find it inconvenient not to pay the policeman at the traffic light who demanded a bribe. That is not what's going to deal with corruption. We need to enforce and protect laws that help whistleblowers. Because one thing I can tell you from experience with corruption, the only people who know it's a secret, who think it's a secret, are the people involved. There's a lot of other people that know. I've never known of a corrupt act that there wasn't some official, some banker, because you cannot move money with two corrupt individuals in a room. Everybody can see what's going on. But we haven't built the culture that creates the indignation to say, let's do something about this. Or that encourages and protects those that will come forward. So, Arch, I wish I could say on your birthday, I'm here to talk about jobs and how young people can get into jobs. Because as I said, it gave me a heavy heart to talk about corruption. But, Here's some good news. As hard as it looks today, as bad as it might look today, it's never been better in this fight. If you're young, you're going to be pretty upset with me. Say, can't you see? Listen, they used to, I remember. You couldn't get, you know, we would, if we were traveling somewhere, you kept a few $50 notes here, a few $100 notes here, some in this pocket, so that you could be paying all the way. We've got nothing like that anymore. Maybe they got smarter, but it, it's down. It's easier to do business in Africa. It's never been this easy. But we have work to do. I could not talk about corruption tonight without showing my appreciation for the institutional work around the Zondo Commission. That's what we need to be doing and more of. That's how we have to do it. But we have to go the full mile. It must end up with prosecutions. It must end up with those who have been found to have let us down. Taking the punishment for it. Not because we seek vengeance, but because we seek justice to ensure that we have the foundations for a just, fair, dignified society 
built on work and the values we all hold. The values that lit the flame of our vision for liberation. We have to kick corruption out. We all are responsible on corruption. There is no, at least maybe Archmai reads the Bible better than I do. I don't recall that there's different hells, one for little things and one for big things. There's only hell. We have to fight corruption. 13.4 trillion dollars a year lost to corruption. Just think about that. Think of what we could do with that. Thank you. May God bless you. Man of God, arch, servant of Jesus Christ. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Strive Masiwa. It is always a privilege to listen to somebody who is speaking from experience, sharing their pearls of wisdom and crystallizing something that we may have been feeling, but you said it in such a very powerful way. Thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Strive Masiwa. Another round of applause, please, for him. To give his reflections, um, I'd like you to please help me welcome onto stage Archbishop Tabo Mahoba to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, uh, Arch, uh, Your Grace and Mamalia, once again, a happy birthday uh, to you. I know the, the ensemble did sing for you, but Mamalia's birthday is next week on the 14th. Can we just do a repeat of the happy birthday? Uh, please, please. Now we're singing for both of them. Please stand. I was initially asked to close with a prayer and then asked to offer some reflections. And I think the story strive as you spoke and the picture that came to mind was a picture of David and Solomon in the Bible. You have pressed hard that corruption is corrosive, but corruption can be defeated. We need to be wise, we need to be resolute, and your narration of your personal journey 
was much more powerful for me. It said to me, each one of us can uproot corruption. And when you said we can't uproot corruption without a price, it was also very important to hear that for those that are corruptors, have corruptees, and the corruptors have got sophisticated machineries and structures that make people to be fearful. But you've encouraged us that there is a price to be paid and we each need to pay a price. When you mentioned the quantum of how much is lost to corruption and what we could do with those trillions of rents, it reminded me, and I hope all of us, that we can't say with our lips that the, something ought to be done for the poor when we know that a lot of money is stolen from the poor and they are made more poor by those who steal so much money. We each have a story and your story was very powerful and persuasive. And your story has encouraged me that I will not sit down and be idle when I see corruption. But you equally said, you can't fight it alone. We need legislation, we need smart legislation that can enable us to fight corruption. And your practical examples of what type of legislation is needed was also very edifying and very helpful. Thank you for your courage. The courage, indeed, that is encapsulated the life of the person that we are celebrating today, Archbishop Emeritus Tutu, a person of deep prayer, a person of faith, a person of hope, who does not believe that darkness will overcome light. Your story was indeed a story of light, a story of encouragement. I hope we will each go out now into the world and be ambassadors of peace and ambassadors of the common good and ambassadors of those that are not corrupt. You heard that it is the corrupter and the corruptee, that corruption has a giver and a receiver. And so let us pray. Deep peace of the run, running wave to you, deep peace of the flowing air to you, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the shining stars to you, and deep peace of uncorrupt South Africans to you, and deep peace of courageous South Africans to you. And so go into the world in peace, be of good courage, fight the good fight of faith, and finish your course with joy. And the blessing of God's sustainer and redeemer be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop Tabo Mahoba. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings our evening to a close. Um, I would like to thank our esteemed guests this evening. Thank you so very much, Mr. Strive Masiwa. Thank you so much to Archbishop Tabo Mahoba, uh, to Nicholas Kielstrom Mateke. Thank you to you as well. Thank you so much to Piyushi Kotecha. 
Um, I would like to now invite my guests on stage to stand up and uh, just line up here for a photo opportunity for all our media that is present here today. So if you could just line up here quickly, they'll be standing here while the Cape Philharmonic Wind Ensemble prepares their final goodbye. But we cannot uh, end this evening without giving a very deep thank you to those who made this evening possible. So thank you so much to the city of Cape Town. We really really do appreciate you for your ongoing support uh, and your partnership with the foundation. Thank you so much to Bridgeway Foundation, the Omidyar family, AK Pier and Peninsula Beverages. Um, you have participated and made this year's International Peace Lecture phenomenal. And finally, just for the last time, a very, very happy birthday to you, Arch, and to you, Mamalea, for next week. Thank you so much for having us all. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the Cape Philharmonic Youth Wind Ensemble, who will send us off with the final goodbye. In peace we go. Media, if the media could come forward, and we'll just have our guests standing here, if the media can come forward. Thank you.